When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom. Like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. It's time to throw out the calculators. In this episode, I'm sharing four steps to know how much money you should save for retirement. Welcome to Everyone's Talking Money Podcast. I'm your host, Shauna Game. There's no judgment, no dumb questions, just smart conversations about you and your money. So come on in and grab a seat. Everyone is welcome here. Welcome back to the show. It is so good to have you here. I secretly always love doing these solo episodes. It's a it's a chance for me to really dive in and share some thoughts around topics that are fun to research and combine my knowledge of all those years working as a financial planner with people just like you. So this episode is a question I get asked very often, and it's actually a little bit of a tricky question. There are undoubtedly, so many articles and blogs and podcasts out there that will have you just plug in your age, plug in an expected retirement date, and it will just spit you out a number. And that's supposed to be your magical number of how much money you need for retirement. But here's the issue with that. There are way too many factors that that very simple calculation just doesn't take into account. So yeah, if you If you want to still use those calculators, in fact, I'll put some in the show notes because they're very easy to use. But if you've never done this before, what I want you to do is use this episode as a, let's think beyond the calculator. Let's go a little beyond just the standard numbers that kind of pop out at you. And let's think about the life that you want to create. And then how do we come up with a retirement number based around that life, because that's what's really important. There's stuff that you want to do in life. There's a way that you want to live your life. And that's very unique to you. And I think that's what, I don't know, there's obviously this trend of DIY finance and DIY is great. It's it's inexpensive. And there are so many ways that you can figure out big pieces of your, essentially your financial plan without having to pay someone But when it comes to something like retirement, this is a time when I might think about working with a financial planner because they're really adept at helping draw out of you what you really want your life to look like. So we kind of take it out from the calculator. But in this episode, I'm going to do my very best to walk you through how you should be thinking about it. So maybe you don't quite need to hire a financial planner yet. So the simple truth of the story is that while you're working, the goal is to save what you can, when you can, in any retirement account you can. So 401k, a Roth IRA, a traditional IRA, a 403b, whatever you have access to is going to work. It's going to do the job. And without a fancy calculator, I can tell you that the more you save, the better off you're going to be. 
but I think you already knew that, right? (laughs) There's just some simple math that goes into it. So oftentimes when I get asked the question, how much money should I save for retirement? The answer is always, well, I don't know how much you can you save because I, I'm sure I've shared this on the show before, but I don't think there's anyone who has ever taken their very last breath on this earth and said, oh, you know what? I think I've saved too much money. That just doesn't exist. So I want you to actually be in that category. I want you to be someone who, when you get to your very last day, you actually say, maybe I have too much saved because I want you to be able to have that luxury of not having to worry about running out of money in retirement. And that is the really real risk, fear, whatever you want to call it, is that you go through your life, you go through your working years, and you're kind of living life. You're doing your thing, right? We're, we're all ordering Uber Eats, and we're all going out, and we're all spending our money. And if you look at any of the studies and the statistics, they'll show that we are all, I don't care if you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, we're all saving less for retirement than we'll probably actually need. So before I kind of get into some numbers, I've got a couple of thoughts around retirement that I just want to share with you. In my opinion, I think retirement in the traditional sense is not going to look like what it did for our parents and definitely for our grandparents. I think we're going to find ways to make money even in our older years. And hopefully most of that is some sort of maybe passive income. So whether that's real estate or investing or maybe book sales or an Amazon product or some other sort of business venture, who knows? But I think most of us, we aren't just going to have that retirement where we literally stop working one day and we just sit in a rocker and kind of wait out life. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, oftentimes I would love to just sit in a rocker and not have anything to do. But I think just the sheer cost of living in our older age and then the fact that we're living longer is going to keep us making money longer. I don't know what the actual age is is for you. Everybody listening to the show is a very different age. But the reality that we could all end up living close to 100 or even in our 100s is very real with technology and medicine and just overall health. We're all living a lot longer. So if you think about the traditional way that we think about retirements, that we we stop working at, say, 65 or 70. But if we live to 100, let's say we stopped working at 70, that's 30 years that we're going to spend in retirement. That's a really long time. That's more time than when you were from birth to when you probably first started your first job. So it's just fair to say that we're going to need a lot of cash (laughs) and there's really no other way to slice it. So it's not to say that we don't need money saved. So saving money is just, it's going to give us options. So even if you plan on working longer, even if you have passive income sources, Still thinking about retirement from this perspective is that the more money you have, the more money you have saved, the more options that you have. And options are a good thing if you ask me. If you just think about the pandemic, we don't know when another pandemic is going to come. And what if that is the year you decided to stop working? And what if the stock market didn't go as good as it did end up going in the latter half of 2020 and 2021? I mean, they're just, there's so many X factors. So All you can do now is just breathe a little bit. If you're feeling a little stressed out already, maybe you haven't saved that much for retirement. I just want us all to take a collective deep breath. Just breathe. And I want you to just know as we go through this episode, it's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. All right. I want to take away a lot of those freak out moments that happen because there are a lot of money experts out there that might point a finger in your face and tell you that for whatever reason, you haven't done very well saving. That's not me. We're not going to do that, right? We're going to we're going to write this ship a different way. So back to this idea of figuring out your number. I want to run down some things to bring more context to the amount than just that simple retirement calculator can spit out. So the first thing I want you to think about is that it all starts with getting specific for what you want your life to look like. 
I talk about this a lot on the show, but it's for a very good reason because I know how powerful it is for you to draw out what you want your life to look like, what you want the next year to look like, the money goals you want to achieve. If you get very, very specific, what it does is it actually starts telling your brain, hey, look at these things. We need to start being intentional so that we can actually achieve these things. The, the number one reason that most people don't achieve resolutions, if you will, that's why I don't like to talk about them. I like to talk about intentions because again, intention is more of a feeling. A resolution is something that I'm holding to, I'm either going to do it or I'm not going to do it, right? So there's a pass fail element. The reason that most people don't actually achieve their resolutions is because there isn't enough meat or enough why or enough feeling behind it. Sure, you might want to work out more, maybe you want to eat better, maybe you want to do something better with your money, and that's fantastic to say, but I want you to really get down to the depth of it. Why? Why is that important to you? When you start attaching that emotion to the thing that you want to achieve, that is really where the magic starts happening. So it's very simple, like get out a piece of paper draw or write or post pictures of what you want your life to look like. Now, I want you to think about like, let's say 60, 65 plus. What is that vision for that future you? Remembering, of course, you could live until maybe well past 100. So that's a lot of years to really think about. But I want you to get specific. Like, where are you living? What are you doing? How do you spend your time? What kind of house are you in? Is it paid off? Do you have a mortgage on this house? Are you renting? Are you living in a tiny house? Maybe you're living in an RV and you're traveling. Do you go on vacation? If so, where? What are you doing to stay healthy and active? How often are you eating out and spending money? I want you to think about everything that you possibly can. And yes, I know this is all hypothetical, of course. We're thinking about it from the context of whatever age you are right now. But when you're dialing in a number for retirement, that's hypothetical as well, because there are a lot of X factors. We don't know what the market's going to do. We don't know what your health is going to be like. We don't know your life expectancy. We know what it says on a piece of paper, but we don't know the actual reality of what's going to happen. So, so much of it is hypothetical, but that's okay. The important piece is just to think about who do I want to be in the later years of life? Because that's going to be the GPS system behind your money. That's what's going to help you right now start to make some of those saving decisions. So I don't want you to just think lightly of this process. I want you to actively do it. Maybe you pause this episode right now and get out a piece of paper and just go to town on it and then come back for the final three points. Whatever you want to do, just take some time out and do this. Because this is going to then create the framework for everything else. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news... Well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic, and it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps, but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. 
After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. I'm Samantha Cole, host of the new season of Understood, The Pornhub Empire. Over the course of four episodes, I'll tell you how a horny YouTube knockoff in Canada came to dominate the porn world, only to shatter their cheeky reputation in a massive scandal. The Pornhub Empire is a new season of Understood from the CBC. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. All right, so number two. Then you have to start with right now. This is where this idea of knowing your numbers comes into play. Again, I love the idea of cash tracking over budgeting. So let me explain. Cash tracking lets you look at where you spend your money without feeling this sense of having to cut back like you really do when you're when you're thinking about budgeting. Essentially, it's the same thing, but with cash tracking, you're playing more of like a detective role where you spend your money. You're kind of looking at where am I spending my money? Is there anything better I can do with my money? Anywhere I can route it. Maybe I can make just a different decision or maybe I notice something in my cash tracking like, oh, I'm paying a fee or I'm still paying some sort of subscription or some sort of service that I actually don't need anymore. One of the most common fees when you're cash tracking that you find are bank fees, whether it's ATM fees or maybe your bank is just charging one of those crazy monthly fees, which by the way, you shouldn't be paying. There are loads of amazing banks out there. We've had so many on this show where they are truly zero fees. Even if it's only a couple of bucks a month, I would pretty much guarantee that there are a million other places that you could put that couple extra bucks a month. So what you're looking at are, there any ways to drive more money every month towards your goals and away from just pure impulse spending? Sure, we're all going to do it. I am very guilty myself. I think after the holidays, I went on a crazy shopping spree and I was thinking, what am I doing? This is not very intentional. This is not an intentional way to start out the new year. But there were actually things that I needed, a few things that I didn't need. But the point is just don't get down on yourself. It's going to happen, right? We, we're still living life in this process. This is what cash tracking is all about. It's about being this detective in your money and figuring out, do I like the way I'm spending my money? If not, is there anything I can do about it? Can I make any changes? Maybe if you notice that your rent is really high and it's stopping you from saving money or from investing or paying down debt, sure, you can't just walk out on your lease But maybe when your lease is up, maybe that's just a gentle reminder like, hey, let me find something that actually works better for my cash flow that can put me in a better spot, right? So it's all about being more empowered with your money and putting yourself back in control rather than feeling so ridiculously out of control with your money, which by the way, is just a common feeling. You feel it. I feel it. We all feel it. So all you need is a good app or you can just simply print your bank statements and see where you're actually spending money over the last month. And then you can make the changes this month and then you just kind of rinse and repeat. So traditionally speaking, the experts, quote unquote, say you're going to need somewhere around 80% of your pre-retirement income to cover the costs of living in retirement. In other words, let's say you make $100,000 now you're going to need around $80,000 per year in today's dollars after you retire. Again, there are a million X factors that come into play, but that just gives you a rough estimate. Some people say 70%, some people say 80%, some people say 90%. It's kind of up to you to figure out what makes most sense. So this is really where we come back to number one and we come back to our vision If we want to travel and and do things like that, you might need closer to 90% of your pre-retirement income. Also, there are factors like, have you paid off your mortgage by now? Or are you still renting? Or maybe you still have a mortgage at age 65 or 70 or whatever year you are kind of tracking towards wanting to retire. All of those numbers just really come to play. So when you're crafting your vision, 
try to think this out a little bit. How expensive are my retirement years looking like? Am I going to need to really think about that target number? Am I more in the 70% range or am I probably going to be in more in the 90% range? I always say, if you ask me, I would shoot for the higher number. (laughs) And if it ends up that you only need 70, 75 or 80% of your, of your income, fantastic. You just have more cash, right? Rather than shooting for a lower figure and you get to retirement and there's still a few holes to plug, right? Which again, is not the end of the world. None of this is the end of the world. So I, I don't want you to have a, a minor meltdown here. Just just hang with me, all right? So number three, we have the vision. You have this rough estimate of how much pre-retirement income you're going to need to cover your life in retirement. So from there, you've got to figure out how much money you'll have each year in retirement. So the old wisdom is to use a 4% withdrawal number. And while the 4% rule has plenty of flaws, it's kind of a good starting point for determining a safe annual withdrawal amount in retirement. So let's let's walk through this, all right? So the 4% rule says that in your first year of retirement, you can withdraw 4% of your retirement savings. So if by that year, whatever year that is, that you decide you want to retire, you have a million dollars saved. You could take out 40%, which is 4% of a million, during your first year of retirement. From there, you would adjust this amount upward to keep up with your cost of living increases. So let's look at that in reverse a little bit. If you needed $4,000 per month, $48,000 per year, from your savings, you should aim to have about $1.2 million in retirement savings. So we can kind of work that both ways here. But thinking about that 4% withdrawal, that can help you figure out, okay, if I've saved a million or 2 million or whatever that number is, and I just, for now, use that 4% rule, that's going to tell me how much I have each year. And realistically, what do I think about that number? Right? So these are just things for you to think about. File them under that category. Depending on where you live, you will likely have some sort of government assistant for retirement as well. For example, in the U.S., currently we have access to Social Security. Will it be around in the future? I don't know. If you have a crystal ball, I'd really love to know what it says because I'm not, I'm not quite sure how this one works out. Maybe, maybe not. But what you can control is how much you save and you can keep working towards that vision for your life, right? You can just keep putting one foot in front of the other each day. You can actually head to the Social Security website if you live in the U.S. It's really cool because you can get a copy of your statement every year and that lets you see what your benefits would be given how much you've paid in thus far, right? So it's it's going to adjust upwards the more you work, but it's just a fun experiment to kind of see how you would fare and how that would factor in. I don't know. I just like those kind of experiments. So I, I would say try the calculators, try, you know, go to the social security site, just play around with some of this stuff. You might also be expecting maybe an inheritance from a family member somewhere in, in life here. And sure, that can absolutely be used to fill in any gaps. I don't want you to ju- just rely on social security. I don't want you to just rely on the inheritance. I want you to also figure out how to bulk up some retirement savings yourself. Again, the theory is that more money is always better. So even if we have a couple of different buckets of money, that's just going to set you up in a better place. So number four, we got to go back to the present. The general advice is that you should save somewhere between 15 and 20% of your gross salary. So that's before taxes for retirement. Remember, this counts as well any employer match. So that counts in that percentage. So let's just pretend. Let's say you're making $60,000 a year. You should aim to save between $9,000 and $15,000 a year in retirement. But again, that includes your employer match. So again, another moment not to freak out on, all right? I know that can feel like a lot. So if you're just starting out, I want you to start small. 
Start with somewhere between one to 5% of your gross pay, and then just work your way up. It's easier to go in small increments. Just make sure you're inching up along the way. So if you get a raise or a bonus, challenge yourself to bump up that percentage by 1% or 2%. If you go the smaller percentages, you're also not going to feel it as much in your paycheck. So it's not going to be like, oh my God, (laughs) I suddenly don't have all of this money, right? Just slow and steady and easy. That's going to win the race. So based on a few articles I've read, here's what, again, quote unquote, the experts recommend in terms of savings. Now, I want you to take this with a full, very large heaping spoonful of salt because not everyone is in the luxury, I should say the same position, let's just put it that way, in order to hit these numbers. So if you're someone where you just want to track against your age group and how much you should save, I'm going to give you those numbers. But for most of us, it's going to be skewed a little bit. So the experts recommend that by age 30, you should have saved one times your annual salary by 42 times, 54 times, 66 times, and 67, eight times your annual salary. That is what the quote unquote experts recommend that you have saved for retirement. But again, there are so many X factors that go into this. And the primary X factor is just what do you want your life to look like when you get to that retirement age? That's going to dictate these numbers. So if you're saving around 15% of your income now, but if you're going for 25%, of course, these numbers are going to be a lot higher. So Uh, just give that a little perspective. Also, let me point this out. You've heard me and so many other guests on this show say this, but there is truth here. The earlier you start saving for retirement, potentially the less you have to save for retirement. And that's a good thing, but it doesn't mean that it's all over if you haven't started to save when you were younger. So I was really diligent when I came out of college, really started to save for retirement, and then life got a little sticky, a little icky. I got divorced along the way, and I basically had to walk away from all of my retirement savings. So that's not a fun position to be in, but that happens. That's reality for a lot of us. There's all sorts of situations. Maybe you have to tap into your retirement savings. The point is that it's okay. If you started to save when you're young, if you're listening to this show now and you're in your early 20s, the best thing you can do is start saving even a small amount of money. But if you're in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, and you're listening now, it's going to be okay as well, right? We just have to we just have to change the direction of the ship a little bit. So let me give you an example. At age 25, your suggested savings rate is 15% of your gross pay. At age 30, it goes up to 18%, and at age 35, it goes up to 23%, and so on. So what I want you to do today is just focus on what you can do today. I want you to create your vision. It totally and will completely change over time, and that's okay. At least you have an idea of what you want your later years to look like. That vision just gives your money direction, right? It's just like the navigational force behind your behind your money. So you have an idea of how much you might need. So if you want to live in, let's say, Manhattan, and maybe you want to live the life, you want to go out multiple times a year, you want to travel abroad, and so on, you're definitely going to need a lot more money saved than somebody who just wants to live in their mortgage-free house somewhere with a real low cost of living. Maybe they occasionally take some trips, they go see the grandkids, they explore somewhere new, but they have a lower cost of living. Neither one of these are right or wrong. They just are. Hey, it's your life. (laughs) It's pretty cool, right? It's your life. You get to live it. You get to design it how you want. I think that's really super cool is that we have that within each of us. But you can reverse into this a bit while you're working so that when you get to 65, 70, you're just in a better spot. You took the time now, whatever age you're at, to be conscious and intentional with your money. And by no means, that does not mean that you don't spend your money to live in your 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. But it means that you're tracking your cash each month. You're making small corrections in your spending and saving. 
and you're thinking about your buying decisions maybe a little bit differently. You're thinking about it a little bit from this educated perspective. You're kind of challenging yourself. You're also challenging yourself to increase your contribution percentage. Again, if only by 1% a year. So the point of this is that you're living in the present, meaning this moment right now with your money. And I find it's way too easy to get caught up in your past mistakes and then let that stop you from living in the present. Or maybe you're just fully, fully focused on worrying about the future. And let me tell you, friend, you cannot control either of these things. I've tried. It doesn't work. The only thing you can do right now is today. That was just a really tough lesson that I had to learn. But I don't want you to let those money lies or those blocks or anything that's happened in your family. I don't want you to let any of that stop you any longer. All right, so you've got your marching orders. You've got four steps to figure out, even if it's only roughly how much you need to save for retirement. I'm going to be putting a ton of calculators and resources in the show notes. So if you're interested, go test them out, test them out with ages and saving rates and all sorts of different numbers just to get a feel. But I don't want you to get stuck in the numbers. Just let the numbers kind of inspire you as to what you need to do today with your cash. So I hope you enjoyed this solo episode. If you did, please share it with a friend or family member. That's a great way to keep this show growing and also to keep this education just rippling out. Also, I just wanted to take some time on solo episodes in particular to read some reviews. I really appreciate you taking time to leave the review. So I want to give a couple of people a shout out. So we've got Belinda228 and she says, great money podcast. I share it with all my friends. Honestly, it just feels good to feel good about my money. Like who knew that was possible? Thanks, Shauna. All right, Belinda228, I got you, right? (laughs) Who doesn't want to feel good about their money? And then we've got Mike Rod 266 who says, Really, really love the episode on how to train your brain to achieve money goals. I've listened about 10 times already. Always good info on this podcast, and I always feel safe learning here. Highly recommend. I mean, I don't think there could be any better compliment than that. Thank you. Yes, this is a safe space for everyone to come learn about money. And I really love that episode too. I think all of you listening did. That episode was one of our most highly downloaded episodes for last year. If you haven't listened to it, I'll link in the show notes, but it was amazing about how to train your brain really to be able to achieve these money goals that we kind of get stumped on. And we got one more review from Becca206. She says, always love this show. I've made a lot of money mistakes, but I feel like I'm a lot better after hearing from every guest. I love all the variety of the topics too. I honestly never miss an episode. If you want to not be yelled at or talked down to, this podcast is for you. Also, I'm sharing my January goal to pay off $1,000 on my credit card. I know I can do it. Thanks again for this podcast. Yeah, I mean, what an amazing goal, Becca. So we're about halfway through January. I hope you are halfway to that goal. I'm going to be cheering you on throughout the way. As always, if you haven't done so already, I genuinely appreciate all the reviews. I'm going to try and shout some out on a few solo episodes coming up. And you can head to the show notes for all the links that I've mentioned in this episode, as well as the links to our episode sponsors. When it comes to work, communication is key. Even if you don't have a writing job, sounding unconfident, indecisive, or passive aggressive can hold you back professionally and hurt your team's productivity. Grammarly Premium's advanced tone suggestions make sure you're always sending the right message. Sound clear and confident in your writing and automatically replace negative leaning language with solution focused alternatives. With Grammarly's help, you can build stronger relationships at work, be constructive in the face of challenges, and help your team get things done. Grammarly works where you do, so your team's projects get done before the deadline. And with features like comprehensive spelling, grammar, and clarity-focused sentence rewrites, Grammarly helps keep your writing efficient and mistake-free. The right tone can move any project forward. Get it just right with Grammarly. 
Go to Grammarly.com slash podcast to sign up for free. Then get 20% off when you upgrade to premium. That's 20% off at Grammarly.com slash podcast.